<clears throat> okay, so I guess we can we can start. Um, um, so um, uh, we posted the lecture note on the web. So if you go to the link for video and file, you can find the lecture note. It's, um, so you don't have to copy what is on the board. So you can um, read them later. So here's, here's what we have uh, from previous lectures. So <clears throat> we, we are considering a particular um, model of uh, rotors. So there's some lattice, say, uh, of L to the D sites, and L is the linear size, and D is the space dimension. Okay? So if it's a two dimension, think of a square lattice. Okay? And at each side, there is a, a rotor which, has a, which can rotate within a circle. And uh, <clears throat> we are considering a simple Hamiltonian uh, from which we can study some uh, emergent phenomena. So this is one, one of those Hamiltonian. Here, the first term, what I call U term, is just a, a kinetic energy, okay? Whose energy is proportional to the square of the angular momentum at each side, okay? And then you, you sum over all sides. Okay, that's the U term. And uh, T term describes the coupling between uh, neighboring sites. So you sum over all uh, nearest neighbor site. So this, if I write IJ like this, it's a, it's a directed uh, pairs of sites. So I sum over 1, 2, and 2, 1, 1, 3, and 3, 1, et cetera. Okay? And then uh, this describes a coupling between uh, rotor at site I with a uh, with, with, uh, rotor in its uh, neighbor, okay? And physically, this term describes the motion of angular momentum. If you have uh, angular momentum at site I, say, say site J, and then if you apply this term, then that angular momentum moves to site I, okay? So it, it describes some diffusion of angular momentum. Okay, and then uh, total Hamiltonian is given by sum of these two terms, okay? And this, this Hamiltonian has a global U1 symmetry. By this, I mean uh, that this Hamiltonian commutes commutes uh, with, uh, with the total angular momentum operator. And the uh, physical meaning of that is that um, under the time evolution, the angular momentum doesn't change. So in that sense, angular momentum is, total angular momentum is conserved. So that's one important consequence. Um, um, and uh, what this uh, uh, total angular momentum does is to uh, generate uh, translation in the angular space. And it's a global translation, meaning that uh, upon applying this uh, unitary operator generated by this uh, total angular momentum, your wave function is shifted by some angle, by same angle at all sides, okay? And uh, because this angular momentum translates angle in a site independent way, this kind of term commute, because if you change angle at site i and j by same amount, uh, this term doesn't change, Hamilton energy doesn't change, so that's the intuition, okay? And we say this Hamiltonian has the global U1 symmetry. Okay, so our goal is to <clears throat> understand what kind of ground states can arise for this simple looking Hamiltonian, okay? Um, so I'm, in this mini course, we are only going to consider ground state. So we are explicitly consider the t equals zero limit, okay? Um, now, 
If you had only one of these terms, it will be easy. For example, if you don't have T term, if you had only U term, then uh, ground state would be, because this is a positive definite, and square is positive definite, ground state would be the state where all angular momentum is zero at every side. That would be the one and only ground state when T is zero, right? On the other hand, if you didn't have the U term, if you have only T term, energy will be minim minimized if all angle is pointing in one direction. That way, theta I minus theta J is same, therefore, for T positive, that will minimize the energy for the T term. So that will be the ground state, okay? However, when you have both, it's harder to find the ground state because you cannot specify angular momentum and angle simultaneously because of the uncertainty principle, okay? So if you want to minimize the angular momentum term, then you have to pay the price of increasing the energy for the T term and vice versa, okay? This is where the complication and uh, interesting phenomena can, can appear from this uh, simple model. So um, we, we cannot find the exact ground state of this Hamiltonian. However, we can still uh, uh, study some properties of the ground state. And the language that we are going to use is, uh, is this one. So the idea is that since we don't know the exact ground state, why don't we first guess uh, what we think is a good candidate for the ground state. This is my seed state, okay? So if I write just this way, this, this, does, this means this wave function is, of course, uh, many, many body wave function, so it depends on, on all, all uh, angular variables, right? But I, I just write as theta simply. And then I start with some ansatz. Probably in my ansatz, I will have some component of ground state and some excited state as well, because my guess is not exact. And then the idea is to um, throw away the components of the excited state by applying this uh, operator, because uh, in, the, in the limit that this T is very, very large, uh, excited state will be more suppressed than ground state. So therefore, in the limit that T is large, the relative weight of the excited state will go to zero compared to the weight of the ground state. Okay, so up to some normalization uh, in the large T limit, this is, a, this is a ground state. Okay, and you can ask uh, questions like, uh, do I get unique ground state or do I get ground state that depends on my choice of uh, seed state. This kind of question we will be uh, asking. So before we ask those questions, we will first uh, develop some language that we use in computing this object, okay? Again, this H is uh, made of mutually non-commuting operators, so therefore we cannot uh, exactly compute this. So one trick that uh, Feynman uh, developed is to break this operator into many small pieces, okay? Where epsilon is a very small step, we can view this T as some imaginary time because uh, usual time evolution is, this is the usual time evolution operator. So if you replace T with minus I tau, minus I, minus I capital T, that would be this operator. So you can view this as a evolution, but not along the real time, but in the imaginary time direction. This is just a mathematical way of obtaining a ground state, okay? And then you break this time evolution into many small steps of uh, time evolution, imaginary time evolution, okay? Because when this epsilon, one step size is very small, you can, uh, we can uh, uh, split this into uh, 
U term, evolution by T term, and evolution followed by uh, evolution by U, by U term to the leading order in epsilon. I hope that everyone has uh, checked this in the homework. Okay, and uh, and uh, first let's uh, evolve my seed state with a T term, which is easy because uh, this angle operator. Um, uh, so this this uh, the 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 my wave function is already written in the basis where my angle operator is diagonal, right? So if you apply the op angle operator to this wave function, the wave function of this new state is simply product of this uh, operator where this angle operator would be re replaced with this angle, right? So this is my wave function after applying this uh, t evolution for epsilon time. Okay. Is this okay? Okay. Yes. Sorry? No, this, this could see it can be anything. This can be any function of theta. But we are asking, um, so this is the wave function of my seed state. Okay, this describes the probability amplitude for my rotors to have this angle. Okay, now this is a new state. Okay, and then I'm saying the pro the, in the new state, the probability amplitude for finding my rotors to have angle theta is given by this. Okay, so this, this doesn't have to be a delta function. Okay. And then, now let's uh, apply this operator. This is harder because um, uh, this angular momentum operator acts as a differential operator in the wave function written in the position basis. Okay? So you have to apply differential operator here. Okay? So instead of doing that, what we are going to do is to rewrite this wave function in the box as a linear superposition of eigenstate of angular momentum operator. Okay? The important thing is the angular momentum is a Hermitian operator. So eigenstates of those angular momentum operators form a complete basis. Right? So any wave function can be written as a linear superposition of eigenstate of the angular momentum operator. So, this is the eigenstate of angular momentum operator, where eigenvalue for ni is ni1. So ni1 is just a dummy index, right? And then uh, this psi that depends on n1 is the weight for each uh, eigenstate of the angular momentum operator, right? OK. Now, this is uh, an eigenstate of my angular momentum operator. So when I apply this angular momentum operator to this wave function, then this just becomes this number because it's an eigenstate. Right? So when I apply this, um, I just have e to the minus epsilon h u of n1 for each n1. But then here we have to sum over all n1. Yes, yeah, it is related. Yeah. So we are transforming spaces? Right, so if you know either this or this, by rotating the time direction in the complex plane, you can obtain the other. So this trick is called weak rotation. So you can view this as a weak rotated form of the time, evolu time evoluted state. Okay? But here we just stick to the imaginary time. Okay, and then now this weight 
of uh, each angular momentum state for this wave function. It's just key, okay. What's the physical implication, meaning of this operator? Yes. It cools your state. I, if you have an initial state that includes ground state and many excited state, this operator filters out excited state so that at the, at the end of the day, in the large T limit, you only have the ground state. Okay. So in that sense, it's a, it's a cooling operator. It cools your state. To a, to a lower and lower energy. It Yeah, good. So this this operator is not unitary operator, uh -huh. right? So because it projects out excited state, so norm is not preserved, but that's fine. Uh, to the leading order, I mean, this is not normalized state that you obtain, but at the end of the day, you can renormalize it, but what you have is only the ground state. That's what matters for us. This is just a way to write down the ground state. Okay. Any, any other question? Okay, so what I was going to say is that the weight of uh, this state in the basis of the angular momentum eigenvalue n i of one. So this n one n one is just a, this is a first step of evolution. So that's one, okay. And i is the side index, okay. And then um, this uh, weight is just given by inverse Fourier transformation of this function. Okay? So I, I have written down here this weight. N of N1 is inverse free transformation of this function here. Here, theta 1, again, in the, I, I, this is the first step of evolution, but I do the inverse trans transformation for every side i. Okay? That's why I, I have a sum over theta n for every side. Okay? And this is just a, this wave function, right? Okay, now, Combined, this is what you get. So this was the uh, second problem in your in your homework, and uh, uh, for the for the single rotor case, but this is uh, for for many rotor, but it's a uh, uh, straightforward generalization. So from now on, when I write this, by this, I mean this, because I'm is. Uh, uh, it's cumbersome to write all the index every time. So I'm, when I write this, I integrate over all angle at every side. Okay? And then when I write this, I mean I sum over all possible integer for first side, second side, for the fifth side, okay, independently. Okay, so this is the meaning of that. Okay, so this is what we are going to use to complete that, uh, that uh, expression for the ground state. So this is very crucial because we are going to use this to uh, apply the next step and, and so on. So if you have any question about the math, this is a good time to pause for this expression. It's good? Okay. Now, uh, this is the state, o wave function of the state that you obtained after first step of e evolution, okay? Then we get this wave function here, okay? And here, N1 and theta1 are dummy variable. They are summed over, and this theta is the uh, variable for the wave function. That's the, f that's the external variable, okay?
And let's apply once more now. So when I write this, what I mean is that you have an initial state, apply this, apply this, and you have a new state. And I'm asking what is the wave function of the new state uh, at this angle? That's, that's what I mean. Okay. And uh, we already know the result of this evolution, which is uh, this expression here. So this now acts as a new initial state. Okay, um, and then I can use the same formula to write down what I obtain after this evolution, right? So let's do that. So according to this expression, this, this plays a role of the initial state, and this goes here, right? So my initial state, okay, and then I need to have a new dummy variable. Let's call that n2 and theta2. Okay? And there is some corner that is convoluted with your initial wave function. right? So basically, you will have another factor of this convoluted with this, uh, this wave function here. Okay? So let's do that. So we will have a sum over n2 and then d theta2. And then n2i, so sum over all side. And this is, again, my external index wave function. I'm evaluating the wave function at this theta, OK? Just as I did here, OK? Maybe I should use yellow. And then I have a theta 2i, and then um, epsilon h n2 theta 2 times this wave function evaluated at uh, at theta 2, right? Because uh, this is my new dummy variable. This is uh, contracted with this, this variable, right? So I will, have, uh, I will need uh, this wave function evaluated at angle theta 2 which is this expression where I replace this theta with theta 2. So that will be times e to the i and i1, now theta 2, theta 1, and 1, theta 1, times the initial seed, initial seed state. Okay. Now, oh, so I, yeah, I, 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 I have to sum over n1 and theta1. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Because this whole line is the is this thing, right? Now you see the pattern as you apply more evolution, you will have uh, one uh, additional sum over or angular momentum angle with uh, this new factor in the weight, OK? So let me write down the wave function that you obtain uh, applying this small evolution m times. So m is how many times I chop this evolution into little pieces. So we are going to take the limit that m is very, very large. But for now, let's keep m as finite number. Then um, my ground state that I obtained from seed state s evaluated angle theta is going to be the wave function obtained by taking large t limit, OK? And then, um, because I have m such evolution, I will have m, m factors of such sum, right? So 
I will have sum over n1 to nn, okay? And also integration over d theta 1 to d theta n, okay? And then uh, let's first look at this factor. In every step of evolution, you have this complex factor. Uh, and I can write that as a e to the i sum over l from 1 to n, and, and then sum over i, and then n l i theta l plus 1 i minus theta l i. OK, so I have to, so for example, when L is one, L is one it gives uh, n1 theta to minus theta one, which is this one, OK? And, and then for n2, you will have uh, n2 theta, theta three minus theta two, et cetera. And then at the last step, when L equal n, I have uh, n of n times theta n plus one minus theta uh, n, right? But um, theta n plus 1 must be this theta, right? It's, it's not dummy variable. That's the external variable. So I have to uh, say that uh, here, theta n plus 1 is nothing but this theta. OK, so this, when, you, when you put n equal 2, it is, it is that expression here, right? If you put n equal 2, you should uh, reproduce this expression. So this subscript is a side index. This superscript is the theta introduced at each step of evolution. Right. So here, at the first step, we have introduced n1 and theta1 at every side. That is this theta1i and 1i. In the second step, we have introduced n2 and theta2 at each side and they are independently summed over here, okay? And then uh, we, have, uh, we have this factor that depends on energy times e to the minus sum over epsilon times energy evaluated at angular momentum and angle at Lth step times psi s of theta 1. Okay. So take a moment to double check that this goes back to that expression written there when I said m to 2. Right? That's the, when I have 2 evolution. Is this clear? OK, yeah. OK, so yeah, I mean, this, this has been very formal. So let's try to understand what we are doing here. OK, yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, that data one or data which, which one? Here. This is data one. This is as, as this one. This is the. This, this external, so this seed wave function is uh, contracted with the theta one. Only in the theta one, yeah. Because for the next evolution, evolution is acted upon this. So that theta one is uh, already dummy variable, okay? So information about the, this wave function is evaluated at this theta. So what has been already uh, created here just uh, uh, is uh, transferred 
for the next step of, next step of evolution. Okay. Now, this factor here, can be uh, formally written as e to the sum action, okay? That depends on angular momentum and theta at each steps, not just the one step, but it depends on n and theta at every steps, right? Okay. And this action can be written the following way. So, so first of all, this factor, why don't we, this is like a difference between uh, angle evaluated at elf step and the next step, right? So it's like uh, almost a uh, uh, derivative. So to make it as a derivative, let's divide by epsilon and multiply by epsilon, right? And then we are trying to uh, view these uh, steps of uh, evolution as some kind of time, because this is an imaginary time, right? Then we can view this theta as a function of imaginary time. Of course, it's a discrete function. We have discrete index, right? So I can, but in the limit that epsilon is very, very small, I can view this as a function of some extra variable, okay? So I'm going to introduce some variable called tau, which is epsilon times steps of, uh, steps of uh, uh, evolution, okay? So this is like, uh, this plays a role of time, okay? Then this term here is nothing but the derivative of theta with respect to tau, right? And then sum of all time step weighted by epsilon is just the integration. Yes. Capital M? Yeah. Yeah, capital M is the number of steps. Okay. Yeah. Which we, which is going to be taken to infinity later in the limit that epsilon is very small. Yeah. So the first term can be written as I times integration over D tau and I. Now I write formally as a, this n, n as a function of tau. Viewing this as a, this is a function of discrete time, right? L is like discrete time. Now I view this, this as a function of tau. And this term, so d, d tau comes from this epsilon, and this is the derivative of theta i with respect to tau and sum over all psi. So this is the first term. Oh, with this, with this minus sign, I think I need minus sign here. Okay. And then the second term is easy. Again, this sum weighted by epsilon. So this is nothing but the uh, time integration of this Hamiltonian. Okay. So the second term is plus d tau and um, uh, h, okay, let, let, yeah, h and tau theta tau. Let me write explicitly here. Uh, T term These are our functions of tau. This is just tau. Okay. Yes. Hmm? Is this action the, the real uh, the classical action because it has AI? Okay, so we are going to discuss it right now. Okay, so let, let us 
make some connection with uh, what you already have known. So you have seen the Hamiltonian dynamics, right? You know how to, you know what the Lagrangian is, right? Okay. And, um, and uh, in, in Hamiltonian dynamics or Lagrangian dynamics, you probably, you, you, you uh, must have seen that um, classical equation motion can be obtained by extrema extremizing your action, right? So, so probably you know that uh, if you have a, say, particle whose energy depends on its position and momentum, right, then uh, you can construct Lagrangian, which is given uh, through the Legendre transformation given by this is the Lagrangian, and then you and then time integration of this is your action that you have seen, right? And then classical equation motion is obtained by extremizing this action in the space of pass. Okay, you consider all paths that connects your initial position and your final position, right? And then you find the paths that extremize this action, this quantity. And that path is the path that obeys the equation of motion, obeys the Newtonian equation of motion, right? So in classical mechanics, you have the, this notion of action but the system follows through only one path that extremizes your action, okay? And this act action is, is almost same as that action. So to make it more similar, uh, in our case, instead of a position on a line, we have an angle, right? Instead of a linear momentum, we have angular momentum, right? But, one key difference is that here, this is the real time evolution. We are talking about the particle's motion in real time. So to go to that action, we have to switch real time into uh, imaginary time by replacing T with minus I tau. Okay. If you do that, then um, your action become so this dt and the derivative with respect to t doesn't produce any factors of i, but this major dt for Hamiltonian produce factors of minus i here. Okay, so you will have uh, um, i times d tau, and then you will have a uh, minus i and theta plus h. You will have this action if you just do the, this uh, transformation here, okay? So, so you will actually have the, this action is nothing but the action you would usually consider in classical mechanics just written for imaginary time, okay? And then what is more important here is that in quantum mechanics, your wave function is given by sum of all possible values that this angle and angular momentum can take at each time step. Instead of taking just one, one particular path, you have to sum over all paths. Okay? So you, this sum represents sum over all paths because say N1 is the possible angular momentum that this particle can have in the first time step. And two is the angular momentum that this particle can have in the sec second time step, right? And so on. And then similarly for the angular variable. So that's why this is called path integration. You, s you sum over all paths. So difference from classical mechanics and quantum mechanics is that um, in classical mechanics, you only select one particular path. 
okay, in quantum mechanics, you sum over all paths, but of course each path in general contribute differently, and the weight of each path is determined by action here, e to the minus s. Okay, so idea is that uh, larger the action here, its contribution will be smaller in, in, in this context. Okay? But in general, you have to sum over all paths. Yes? So the path from path will have the biggest contribution? That's right. Classical path is the path with the biggest contribution. Yeah. But, but you have to go beyond in order to be precise. Yes? So where, I mean, okay, so probably in statistical mechanics, you have seen some of our configuration as well, right? Where in that, weight for each configuration is weighted by, determined by the Boltzmann weight, right? And if you remember, in the Boltzmann weight, there's a temperature here, and um, in the limit that temperature is small, the statistical fluctuation uh, diminishes. Because for any excited state, its probability to have those excited states in your ensemble become vanishingly small. Okay? So at zero temperature, there is no statistical fluctuation. There is no thermal fluctuation. Still, at zero temperature, we have to sum over all these paths. This is not from thermal effect. This is quantum effect. So for that reason, we call that quantum fluctuation. The fact that we have to sum over all paths. We have to pass fluctuate, right? Not just one path. So this is called quantum fluctuations. And this is because we are, we are dealing with a quantum mechanical system. Yes. So I didn't hear you very well. Maybe you can take. The change that you are making right there from P to minus I, I, yeah. Well, here, this is just, uh, again, this is just, uh, this difference between the two, right? Yeah. So this is a unitary operator that describes time evolution of your state when you watch your state at different moments in time, right? So it, is, it has that meaning. This doesn't have that kind of physical meaning. It, it's just a mathematical way of extracting the ground state, okay. projecting out the excited state. But mathematically, they are related to each other through the rotating the time direction in the complex plane. Okay. Yeah. But we, we don't live in the imaginary time. So in, in real time, this is the, what actually governs the time evolution. But this is a mathematical way of extracting the ground state. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So um, now this is the uh, one of the key language that we are going to use to analyze. Uh, the, the nature of ground state that arise in this, in this rotor model, okay? So, um, again, we mapped difficult problem of solving ground state into another difficult problem. We cannot do this integration exactly. The value of writing the ground state in this picture is, lies in the fact that it gives us a, a very nice physical intuition about what happens, to what, what the ground state look like, okay? So to see that, let's consider some limit first, okay? So first, uh, let's consider the limit where um, T 
ketom is very small compared to utom. Okay. In that case, um, uh, um, there's not much uh, penalty for your for for action by having um, uh, neighboring rotors having different angles, right? Because ketom is so small, you don't have to pay much penalty, right? The action doesn't change much, even if angle between neighboring rotors are opposite to each other. On the other hand, you will pay huge penalty if you want to have a non-zero angular momentum in, in your path, right? So you can imagine that in the limit that u is much, much larger than t, the, the, the paths that contribute the largest contribution will be the path where uh, n is minimized intuitively, right? However, because of the uncertainty principle, if you have well-defined values of n, angular momentum, you cannot have well-defined values of theta. This formalism already includes it because you have to sum over all possible values, right? For example, if this term is very, very large, and then uh, and this, this term is small, so that n is almost zero everywhere, okay? Then uh, this n is almost zero everywhere, or it's uh, well defined here. Then uh, you don't have a, uh, there's, no, no penalty for having wild fluctuation in theta in angular variable, okay? Where you have this phase factor, but different configuration with a different phase, they just uh, contribute oscillatory phase. Their, their amplitudes are not suppressed, right? Because th this first term here is a pure imaginary. It only changed the phase. It doesn't change the magnitude of this weight, right? So you can see, uh, in the large U limit, you will have a large fluctuation in angle, but very small fluctuation in angular momentum, okay? So therefore, to analyze the ground state in the large U limit, uh, it's useful to uh, uh, look at your ground state in the angular basis, so formally, we can first do the integration over theta because this is highly fluctuating variable. So let's do the integration of this first and then look at the path only in terms of angular momentum. So that's, that's one strategy we can use. So let's do that. So this is the third part of the lecture. So we are going to consider the ground state in the limit where u is much, much larger than t. Okay? So then uh, we expect to have a large fluctuations in, in angle, but um, small fluctuations in the angular momentum. And uh, in this section, we can treat this t term as a perturbation because this is a smaller than this, okay? So, let's rewrite that expression here. So what I'm going to do is to write this expression the following way. So we first sum over all n. Um, and then, um, and then we have a sum over all theta. Uh, in terms of uh, theta, the dominant contribution in the action comes from this phase vector because t term here is very small, so we are going to treat this as a, perturb as a perturbative correction. But this is order of one term, right? So let's first consider this term. So maybe this is helpful. So um, the one that depends on theta, external theta, is only this one, right? 
So I have uh, n of m, the last step of uh, evolution times theta, right? So I have, uh, yeah. e to the i n 1 of theta. This is the only term that depends on the, this external variable theta. OK? OK, and then what is the term that depends on, say, uh, theta m? Can, can someone tell me what, what is the term that uh, is coupled to theta m. So from that expression, there are two possibilities. L can be m or m plus 1, right? So you can have uh, theta m from both cases, right? So you can have m, m here, or m minus 1. For example, in this, in this example, theta 2 is coupled to n2 and n1 here. So you have n2 minus n1. Okay? And uh, similarly, uh, for n minus 1, you have n minus 1 with uh, n minus 2, and so on, all the way to Theta two uh, and two minus n one. Okay. And at the very last, at the very last, you have uh, theta n one. Right. So you, you kind of paired this with this. The first factor was the the factor that depends on external angle, and at the very last, you have a theta 1, right? Just by itself, times the seed wave function, okay? So at the very last step, I have a e to the minus i and 1 theta 1 times my seed wave function. OK? And then, of course, we should uh, keep the contribution in the action from the, from the Hamiltonian. But to the leading order, only the u term is important. So let me first write down the u term here, e to the minus u. So let's just write this way. This integration represents the sum of all u term at different time steps, weighted by epsilon, right? And then uh, there is this uh, t term, right? So t term has a e to the t. So we have a, we have a e to the um, epsilon times t, sum of all ij, and sum of all steps of uh, evolution times uh, e to the i theta i minus e minus theta j. Right? This, is the, this is the contribution from t term, right? You have a contribution from each time step, and at, every, at each time, you have a contribution from all pairs of nearest neighbor links. OK? Is it good? Now, assuming that, so since we are considering the limit where t is very, very smaller than u, let's going to expand this in powers of t. Okay? So instead of using this full expression, we are going to expand in powers of t. So exponen exponential of sum can be written as a product like this, right? Of uh, exponential of one factor here 
And then if I expand it, I have a, to the leading order one, when t is zero, it's just one. And then first order term will be epsilon times t times e to the i theta i minus theta j, like this. And then uh, there are high order terms. But to the leading order, actually this is the only thing that is important. Actually, this doesn't require t to be small. This just requires epsilon to be small. Okay. Okay, so this is the full expression of the ground state. Okay. So let's now consider uh, term by term. Let's first consider the, the most important term in the small t limit. Let's first look at the leading order term here, one. Okay. Ignoring all other terms here. So then, uh, this, is, this factor is just one here. Then, um, theta dependencies arises only from this phase factor. Okay. And uh, uh, for example, if you integ integrate over theta i m here with this phase factor, what do we have? This n's uh, integer angular momentum. Then if you have uh, e to the i theta times some integer, what do you have? Well, if you integrate over theta m here, it will vanish unless uh, n m minus n m minus 1 is 0, right? If it is not 0, you have sine or cosine function. And if you sum over one period or integer multiple period, this will vanish because of uh, sinusoidal function, right? So integration of theta for this factor will be just give rise to delta function, the Kronecker delta for n m with n m minus one at each side. So this is, there's a constraint at each side, which means that angular momentum at time step m minus one has to be same as the angular momentum at the next time step at every side. And same is true here. Angular momentum at m minus one step should be same as m minus two step. Okay. So in general, you will have a constraint there at each side. Angular momentum has to be continuous from the previous step. It should be same as the next step. Okay. So that so there will be all the way to n2 equal n1, okay? So that arises from this constraint, okay? But this n1 can be still anything, okay? This n1 is determined by how much angular momentum you have in your seed state, okay? So if you do the theta1 integration here, Okay, if you do the theta one integration for your seed state weighted by this phase vector, this is nothing but the angular momentum n one component of your seed state. Okay, this determines how much weight do you have in your seed state for angular momentum n one. Right? Of course, n one can be anything. You can seed state can have any angular momentum you want. Right? But here. Once the angular momentum of the seed state is determined in the first step, from the next step on, n2 has to be same as n1, n3 with n2, all the way to the final angular momentum here. Right? So angular momentum doesn't fluctuate. It is just determined by initial angular momentum. Okay? 
So instead of summing over, over all possible angular momentum in the path, you sum over only the, say, first angular moment, the angular momentum in the first, uh, first uh, step here, okay, whose weight is determined by the, um, uh, the seed state. Okay? So let's call this the angular momentum component N1 of your seed state. So let's define this as this, right? Yeah. yeah, so yeah, so there's a factor of two pi, there's some constant factor, which I didn't keep because at the end of the day we are going to normalize our wave function. So it only changed the overall normalization. It doesn't change the relative weight between ground state and excited state. Yeah. So so for each initial angular momentum, you have uh, this weight, OK? And then once you have this angular momentum, they just continue. They just evolve without any fluctuation, OK? So that's, that's kind of a first term you have. So here, I have a many term here. The first term here is uh, where I, so this is like a different side, side one, two, all the way to side V, okay? And then uh, initial angular momentum of initial, initial state is determined by this, right? How much component my initial seed state have at that angular momentum sector, right? And then, so if I have, say, uh, zero, 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 then it just continues. So when it is zero, 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 that, that has the largest weight because the weight is determined by this, right? So when everything is zero, this is zero, right? When, when n i is zero. So if, if, okay, so let's, Okay, let's, let's do one more step here. Um, um, let's uh, let's uh, actually expand this. So let's first look at the case where um, contribution from seed state where all n's are zero. Okay, so that's, that's when the Angular momentum that is injected in the initial state is all zero. Okay, so that's when uh, um, this n one is all zero, right? And then uh, n two is also zero, n three is also zero. So it's all the way to zero at every time step. So therefore, for that pass, uh, action is zero because n is always zero, right? So therefore, the weight for that pass is one. E to the zero is one, okay? So there is a, here in this term, there is a one. Where, because n, m is also zero, this is supposed to be m, right? Because, th this is, because n, m is also zero, your final wave function is also independent of theta, right? Which is not surprising. Your final wave function obtained from this particular path has no angular momentum either. Right? So there's no theta dependence, and its weight is one for that particular path, right? So this path here, let's say term one in picture, angular momentum injected from, from the initial state is zero. They just stay zero. But this is, not the, this is not the only contribution. For example, now let's consider uh, the contribution from this t term. Okay? So to the, say, to the li linear order in t, suppose I consider only t term that is linear in my ground state. That means uh, between all possible links, 
and all possible time steps, I inject this t term only once. Okay? But I can inject that any link and any time step, right? So uh, the next contribution, I have to sum over all possible link and all possible time step where I inject the t term there, right? So let's do sum over all link and sum over all possible time. Sum over L here, at which I insert this t term. Okay. And suppose I insert that t term at some particular i j at some particular uh, time step L, right? Then I will have this uh, this uh, additional factor here. And I have to incorporate that while when I do this theta integration, right? So theta integration will be same everywhere except at L step where I insert this operator. Right? So if I insert that L step here, uh, previously I have a L L L minus one, okay. But now with this term, I have uh, additional factors of uh, e to the theta l at side i, right? So what I'm doing here is uh, is uh, expand this expand this factor. Let's call this star. So star is going to be one plus sum of all possible i, j, and sum of all possible l, and then epsilon times t, e to the i, theta i, l, minus theta j, l. This is the term that is linear in t. Okay? So we look at this term contribution right now, one. Now let's look at this second contribution. Okay. Now, when I do the theta integration here, I have to do in the presence of this additional factor. Okay. So, yeah, let's let's uh, this term index called i one n one, i one j one. Sorry, not to be confused with this another term index i. Okay. So. Uh, this extra term will affect the theta integration only in this Lth step, okay? And only at side I1 and J1. Everywhere else is same as before. Char, the angular momentum remains the same as the previous step, right? But at, say, if I have a, if I have a side I1 and J1 here, and if I have a time step L here, at this particular link here, I have this uh, insertion. This amounts to actually creating some angular momentum at side I1, because at I1, I will have uh, um, when, yeah, so this term will be modified into N L I1 minus uh, n l minus 1 i 1 minus 1 here because of this additional factor right at side j1 it will be plus 1 right so that means between step l minus 1 and l the angular momentum at side i1 jumps by 1 Because upon doing the theta integration, again, you will have a constraint that this has to be zero. Okay? So therefore, n at side i1, n at step l is one bigger than angular momentum at the previous step. So that means, even if here you, you injected angular momentum zero here, at this time, the angular momentum jumps by one. 
So you create angular momentum one here, okay? And you create angular momentum minus one here. Again, total angular momentum is conserved, right? So let's draw an arrow like this. In the direction where, in the direction where this arrow is pointing up, that's where angular momentum is positive one. When it is uh, pointing downward, that's where angular momentum is minus one. And this arrow kind of represents the direction along which angular momentum is transferred. Okay. And uh, because I can insert this, so because I can insert this at every side, every link, and at every time step, I have to sum over all possible link and all possible time step, right? And then whenever I insert this, um, the, the weight will be epsilon times t. That's the extra weight for this particular path. So I will have a epsilon times t. And then I have extra action that I have to pay from this u term because I have created non-zero angular momentum along the, along the path, depending on how long this path is, the action uh, will, uh, will depend on, 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 on the duration of that angular momentum along the time direction. Okay? So, we have uh, e to the minus u over four, and uh, we have created unit of angular momentum at two sides, so I have a unit of two. And then um, times epsilon times uh, this angular momentum existed only for L prime greater than L here, right? I, have, I paid the action only after this time, not, not before, right? So I have this, this extra term here. So this term here, so again, you sum over all possible link position, and then you sum over all possible time at which this fluctuation can occur, weighted with the interval of, of time, epsilon. This can be written as a time integration, imaginary time integration. Okay, so this I can write as a d tau. Okay, from zero to t. This can be inserted anywhere from time zero to time t here. Okay, and then this uh, energy penalty, the action penalty is e to the minus u over two. This term is, uh, uh, again, uh, epsilon times different time step can be viewed as a, another time integ integration, right? But this is only from, say, tau to t. Tau is the point where the time step, where the angular momentum has been inserted, the, the, has been created, right? And then in this picture, that continues all the way to time t. Okay. And so on. And there are terms that are proportional to t squared. So there's a t term here. So there are terms that are, that are proportional to, to, to t square and, and so on. Okay. So let's first see what kind of uh, state is generated from here. Um, okay, so, and then we also have to uh, include this factor. Now, angular momentum is non-zero at side i1 and j1, right? At i1, angular momentum is one. And at j1, is angular momentum is minus one. That continues after this point on, right? So therefore, here, um, I have a wave function that has angular momentum one for side I1, and minus one for angular momentum at side J1. I1, J1. So, This would be the leading order correction 
to the ground state that you have uh, in the large U limit. Okay? And this you can compute explicitly. If you, if you compute this, it's just an exponential function that increases linearly with respect to this time duration. And if you compute it, it's uh, 1 over u with factor of 2, maybe. Yeah, 2 over u. Okay. So together, the contribution for this kind of state with a non-zero angular momentum created in your ground state is uh, proportional to t over u. which is small, which is small in the limit that u is much larger than t. So this, this, kind, of, uh, this kind of correction is called uh, vacuum fluctuations. Even in the ground state, angular momentum is not, zero, is not zero everywhere. Of course, that is the dominant contribution. But once in a while, um, particle and antiparticle is created, and they contribute some you have some non-zero probability to find those uh, particle and antiparticle in your ground state. So this is what the ground state wave function look like okay? in, the, in the limit that t is much smaller than u. Now you can include a high order term in t. So um, So now you can draw, di draw uh, figures. For example, this is the term that is linear in T. What kind of fluctuation can you have in the second order in T? You can create, say, um, particle antiparticle here and there, right? This would be also, this, this kind of, uh, you can have uh, multiple pairs of uh, particle antiparticle pairs. This would be second order in T, and you can compute it. The weight for this kind of process is suppressed by T over U to the 2, because you have uh, energy penalty coming from this path and this path, um, and it's second order in T. And also, you know, um, you can have this process as well. You can um, create a particle antiparticle pair here. They propagate for a while. And then you, you create particle antiparticle whole pair here. Then that will annihilate this antiparticle here and move antiparticle from here to here. Okay, and then they can propagate. Okay, so, so this way you can now create a particle pair that are more separated spatially. Okay, but because this is also second order processes, this wave function is also suppressed by two powers of t over u. Okay, also you can also you can you can do this. You can create a particle antiparticle pair here, and then you can create now antiparticle and particle doing, doing this. Then you annihilate the particle and annihilate the antiparticle. Then you just, you, you go back to vacuum here. You go, go back to zero angular momentum state. Okay, this is kind of a, a loop. Okay, you just, uh, in the vacuum, because of the quantum fluctuation, particle antiparticle pops up and leave for a while, but they go back to the uh, vacuum, angular momentum, zero state. Okay, this kind of state doesn't show up in your ground state, but it, it gives rise to some, it enhances the weight for, for, for this configuration, right? That will add up, the probability of this will add up with that probability. Yes. Good, yeah, that's right. So 
Now the question is, uh, how, how can we control the size of the particle anti particle pair? OK, so to answer this question, let's first consider where well, this might be a good homework. You can guess right now. What would be the leading order contribution that um, uh, give rise to particle and whole pair, particle and antiparticle pair separated by some lattice spacing, say, uh, x? What is the lowest order process that is needed to create this kind of uh, vacuum fluctuation? In this example, they are, they are separated by four sites. Fourth order, right? Because you have to create, say, I don't know, particle anti particle pair somewhere here, then you have to separate them. You need to insert more hoping term here, right? So you have to move this particle to here by creating particle anti particle here and move this here at maybe a different time to here. And maybe they can fluctuate back and forth, but this is high order, so let's, lowest order would be this, right? And of course, you have to sum over all possible time where this event can happen, right? And then, so now you can visualize your ground state wave function. So you can draw some possible paths that, uh, that ends up in your, uh, say, final destination. And then you, you compute the weight of such paths just based on how many hoping terms you have to insert that gives some t to the some power of how many hoping terms you have. And uh, from the u term, you have u over four times length of this, this length, this length or duration of this particle and antiparticle, net duration. So given t equals infinity, given infinite time, all such possible paths would happen. Yeah, so you have to, exact ground state will be given by sum of all possible paths. But the point here is that this kind of configuration will be suppressed by t over u to the four in this particular case. If the separation is x, it is t over u to the, to the x, which is exponentially small. But because, because there is such a path, does it mean that it occurs? Yeah, it occurs. It occurs. So there is a very rare chance to have a particle antiparticle pair that are well separated. But those probabilities exponentially suppressed in the limit that t is smaller than u. Good question. Yeah, good question. So that's a very good question. So although we just look at the one path here, right? And then this one particular path is um, suppressed exponentially. But there can be many paths, right? For example, for this destination, first of all, this, this can be inserted at different time. And furthermore, you can you can have uh, more fluctuations. You can have this kind of path, right? Okay. And the in priori, it's not clear whether some of all, all those different paths will converge or not. But it is known that in the limit that t over u is small, if it is small, there's some critical value below which the sum converges. If t is greater than certain critical strengths, then although individual paths is still suppressed, there are so many of them. It's like entropic contribution. This is like energetic suppression. But if there are so many configurations, then there the probability for reaching this 
destination can be significant. Right? So you expect that you might have some phase transition as you tune the strength of T. And that's exactly what happens. As you crank up the strength of the T above certain critical strengths, the size of, size of this, uh, the, the number of, there are so many paths, and then th this kind of uh, controls the tension, right? You can imagine this is some kind of elastic string. And then more stretch the string, more energetic penalty you have to pay, right? So you have a uh, energetic contribution, but then this string is floppy, you can, it, it can fluctuate, right? And then if tension is very, very strong, then even if it can, in principle, fluctuate, you don't have much fluctuation. So in the vacuum, the typical size of the loop is finite. But um, if tension becomes small enough, then um, although the bare tension is non-zero, as you include the fluctuation, the tension gets renormalized. It becomes effectively smaller. That just means that there are many, many ways for creating such configurations, so they, they proliferate. Then the typical size of this particle-antiparticle -particle pair diverges. Okay. And this is precisely what happens at the critical point across the phase transition. They are not because uh, they they eventually they eventually uh, they are not lowest energy state. Okay. So, but there are stable particles. So here we only look at the um, contribution where net angular momentum injected from your seed state is uh, zero, right? But uh, you could have some component of your, in your seed state where net angular momentum is non-zero, right? You could have, uh, say, at this side, initially I have angular momentum one, right? Okay. And because angular momentum is conserved, this state cannot mix with, uh, this, this state cannot decay into this kind of vacuum. Angular momentum has to stay one, right? So all it can do is that uh, it can go straight, or it can, it can move around. It can fluctuate. Okay. And then this is the wave function for the first excited state, for example. You have a non-zero angular momentum, say 1, and then a wave function with a non-zero angular momentum 1, will be given by linear superposition of uh, angular momentum located here and angular momentum located here and so on because they can move around through the quantum fluctuation. So short answer is the, uh, if the net angular momentum is zero, then there is a, in this case, there is a only a one, one uh, lowest energy state, which is, uh, which is linear superposition of, uh, uh, say, 0, 0, 0, 0, or 0, 1, minus 1, 0, et cetera. Okay. And the uh, important thing is that in your ground state, there is some component where you have non-zero angular momentum. But those contributions are exponentially suppressed, like, like this, OK? So as a result, if I find some excitation here, you can ask, uh, what is the probability for me to find some excitation with a negative angular momentum at side x? So that's called correlation. Well, how much is this side correlated with this side? And in this state, the correlation function decays exponentially because 
because such contribution is exponentially suppressed. Yeah, so um, one homework that I'm going to post in that afternoon is to make sure that the lowest order contribution that contribute this kind of uh, particle, antiparticle excitation is at least suppressed by this order, t over u to the distance between the smallest distance between two sides. Okay? I think you can, can easily check. If t is greater than u, everything will diverge, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, uh, I don't remember the critical strength of the t. Uh, it doesn't have to be exactly u, but this order of u. Yeah. So that uh, we, people don't know the exact value of the critical strength. Yeah. But in that case, uh, what could we do? In that case, okay, that's a good question. So, so this kind of expansion is convergent up before the up to the critical strength of t, okay. And then once you reach the critical strength of t, then uh, this is expansion is no longer no longer convergent. And then your ground state is given by sub of many particle and particle excitations of all possible sizes, okay? So your ground state doesn't have finite length scale. When t is small, there's a typical length scale here, okay? It's, it's very rare to find particle and particle pair whose separation is greater than certain typical strengths, right? This defines the length scale, right? You can exponentiate e to the minus x log t over u. So this is some, so I, I can write minus u over t. And this is some one over length scale here. I'm here I'm using the unit where all the lat lattice spacing is one, okay? So this length scale, which is, um, which is small when u is very large, right? This is the typical scale typical size of this uh, loop in your vacuum. And then as, as t become bigger and bigger, this length scale become bigger and bigger, such that if you reach the critical point, then length scale diverges. And then you don't have any final length scale. In that case, uh, you have uh, this phenomenon called um, scale invariance. For example, if you look at the ground state, and then if you zoom, uh, zoom out, if you, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the larger distance scale, okay, your ground state more or less looks same, because you have this loop of all possible size, right? So if I, it's like fractal, right? If you if you rescale your picture. If, if, you in the, if you have a fractal structure, then the picture looks same. And that can happen only if you, have a, you don't have a final length scale. Your length scale is, you have a structure of all possible, at all scale. Right? So at the critical point, you have these fluctuations of all sizes up to infinite. And as a result, your theory becomes scale invariant. And then at that point, this is not a good way of studying the state. Instead, it's, it's more useful to use a uh, continuum theory because the length scale is so big compared to the lattice spacing. <coughs> lattice spacing is not important anymore. So therefore, you can pretend these rotors live in a, some continuum space. And then you can write down some continuum theory and uh, uh, there's a name for scale invariant theories called conformal field theory. So this is where this tool become useful. Okay. So this is not subject of this lecture, but that's a 
that's a, uh, that's a very interesting state. Okay? Pictorial, you basically have uh, this kind of particle and particle pairs of all sizes in your ground state, wildly fluctuating. It's a quantum soup of this, uh, these particles. So therefore, they are so wildly fluctuating. You cannot have well-defined notion of particle. You cannot have a isolated particle there. I think I kind of got lost somewhere because we were on Monday discussing considering a lattice of particles and they have had momenta. But now we are creating particles. There are no particles there. Okay. So where okay. did so we, we are, make this jump? There are two, two kinds of particles here, right? So we start with a rotor. At every side, we, have, we say there's a particle, right? So this is the kind of microscopic particle. Um, and then this particle is not this particle. This is uh, some, this is like uh, some collective fluctuations of those uh, microscopic particles. This trajectory describes where the angular momentum is in space under this imaginary time evolution. Initially, angular momentum was carried by the particle at this side, right? And and minus angular momentum at this side, right? And then, due to this quantum fluctuation, angular momentum is propagating. It, it spread in space. Then now, we are interpreting this line as some trajectory of new particle, OK? Something is moving. So what is moving is not, this particle is not moving, right? This particle is stuck at that particular side, right? But without particle, without this particle actually moving, some information of this particle can be transferred from one side to another side. Say, angular momentum can be transferred from this side to this side, and this side to this side, right? And this pattern can be viewed as a, uh, the trajectory of some particle in space and time. So it's a way to interpret hmm? the propagation of angular momentum. Yeah, propagation of angular momentum is now being interpreted as motion of particle. Okay. So in this sense, particle is nothing but some collective excitation of underlying degrees freedom. And this exactly behave like, mathematically exact behave like a particle, bosonic version of electron and positron. Particle and antiparticle. It's not like analogous. They are, they are, they are the same, mathematically speaking. So for those who have studied, um, I don't know, field, how, how many of you have studied some field theory? Okay. So if you if you say study complex Klein Klein Gordon theory. It is, it is that theory that describes this, this emergent particle. That's a very good question, yeah. Uh, what would happen if I think of these particles as phonons? I don't know if we're, if we're considering temperature. A uh, particle as phonon? Phonons. Phonon. Yeah. Okay, phonon. Okay, so phonon is another immersion particle that emerges in the in the um, in lattice. So if you have a uh, some, you start from say gas of water, and then if you cool it down, it becomes liquid. And if it cools down further, it becomes solid, right? So in, in a solid state, each water molecule takes some definite position. They form a regular pattern in space. This is what we call crystal, right? And then um, water molecule doesn't diffuse. Well, in principle, they, they diffuse, but they diffuse very little. However, if you heat this water molecule, 
if you dump some energy, if you hit space physically, then the vibrational energy of this water molecule can propagate from this molecule to this molecule and this molecule, etc. Okay, it's like a wave made of the vibrational motion of each water molecule. Okay, and the propagation of that energy and momentum. So th this propagation uh, of wave carries the energy and momentum, and they behave like particle. In quantum mechanics, wave is not different from particle, and that is called phonon. Okay, that's the particle that is associated with the vibrational motion of, of the molecule. Here, um, it is similar. I mean, uh, but it's not physical vibrational motion. It's like, it's like a rotational vibrational motion. Wave created by some collective vibration of this rotational mode acts like particle. Still on the topic of convergence, uh, the when when you apply the the path integral to the seed function, is it known like the the convergence space of the of that limit with the integral? Uh, does does that work for any seed function in the Hilbert space? So the 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 if you use the this path integration is well defined. Okay, well defined means that uh, uh, you can, in principle, compute exactly if you have powerful enough computer. Okay, so in that sense, it's uh, well defined non-perturbatively. However, trouble arises when you try to expand yes. using t as a small parameter. Then that expansion doesn't necessarily converge. Yeah. And uh, when it doesn't converge, that's when the phase transition happens. We start um, the rotation of the particles with different initial conditions. Will be any uh, emerge of synchronization okay. phenomena? Okay. Okay. Very good question. So, I guess you are asking if we have chosen different seed state, yeah. can we have a different state here? Okay. Good question. Um, let's consider that. So, I, I mentioned that uh, some seed state where I have a uh, non non-zero net angular momentum here, okay? But in this case, because the angular momentum cannot disappear, this has to continue all the way to the final, final step. So therefore, this kind of configuration is suppressed at least by e to the minus u times t. Because non-zero angular momentum exists at every time step. Okay, so therefore, in the large t limit, this kind of configuration is suppressed. Okay? However, you can have a seed state where you have a, zero not, uh, a net zero angular momentum, say here one and here minus one, right? You can have kind of this kind of seed state. And then uh, this angular momentum will, will propagate, but they cannot last very long because if they don't annihilate, they, they keep paying this energy, energy penalty of e to the minus u over four times whatever the length of their, their life. The longer they live, more expensive it gets, right? So therefore, whatever you created eventually get pair, pair annihilated. So for this reason, in the limit that t is uh, 
smaller than u, the ground state you obtain does not depend on seed state. So therefore, you don't need this label. So you can understand this in a different perspective. So we have this Hamiltonian of um, two ton. Uh, and let's consider energy spectrum of the Hamiltonian as a function of t. Let's fix u to be some non-zero value. And let's start with uh, t equals zero, where at t equals zero, we know the exact eigenstate, right? The exact ground state is the state with, where all angular momentum is zero. That has energy zero here. So there's a one state where all angular momentum is zero. That's unique, right? And then first excited state is given by the state where angular momentum is one or minus one at any one site, right? There are, there's a huge de degeneracy here, right? How many degeneracy is there? How many states are there with uh, energy u over four? Hmm? N squared. So suppose V is the number of sites. V, v is the number of, so L is the linear size, and say V is the number of sites in the D dimension lattice. 2V. 2V. Okay. Because you can put angular momentum 1 at any site or minus 1. So there are two V possibilities, right? So there's a highly degenerate state, two V state in the first, first, as a first excited state. And then the second excited state will be when you put uh, two angular, one, one angular momentum at one side and another unit angular momentum at another side, like that, right? So there's a tower of spectrum here. But the important point is there's a gap between ground state, unique ground state, and the first excited state, okay? And as you tune T to a non-zero value, this gap cannot immediately vanish because energy level should be a continuous function of T, right? Exact energy should be continuous as a function of T. Therefore, they may, some energy level go down, some energy level go up like this, but still, there must exist some finite window before the energy gap vanishes. That's why we can say, at least in the small t limit, the ground state is unique. Which means that no matter which seed state you start with, after this projection operator is applied, as far as your seed state has a non-zero overlap with the ground state, you will have always unique state in the large t limit. Okay? So in this case, uh, there's a unique ground state. So it's a rather boring state, actually, because um, essentially, it's, uh, every side has a zero angular momentum. And once in a while, you can have some uh, particle anti-particle pair generated from quantum fluctuation. But this is, we call, trivial state, because um, as a whole, it's not that different from just sum of individual sites. Okay? So there's nothing more interesting than simple sum of individual sites. So in this sense, we say ground state that you obtain in the small t limit is trivial. Say this ground state here is not qualitatively different from this ground state. Okay? They are smoothly co connected to each other. Nothing interesting happens from here to here. That's right. So that's the topic of the next lecture. So we can do something 
when t is much larger than u. OK. So in that case, uh, in that case, uh, we cannot treat this as a perturbation. And it's better to uh, look for the, in that case, uh, system wants to have a little fluctuation for angle variable, right? Because T is large. So there is a large energetic penalty when angles have a large deviation with its neighbor, right? So essentially, all rotors wants to point along the same direction, more or less, right? But then, um, if u was 0, that will be the exact ground state. OK, so in the extreme limit, when t is infinite or when u is 0, in this limit, um, uh, exact ground state would be uh, where the state where all rotors point along one direction, right? And then, how many are there? When, when u is 0, how many ground states are there? 1? So if I have only this term, how many ways to minimize this Hamiltonian? This is minimized as far as the difference is 0, right? But overall direction is not determined. It can point in any direction, right? Why? Why? Could, that's right. There are infinitely many of them. So in the limit that uh, uh, t is u is zero, there are infinitely many ground state here. Okay. And then when there are infinitely many ground state. Um, uh, you cannot use this kind of argument, saying that upon turning a little bit of uh, u turn, I, I, uh, this ground state will survive. Right? We cannot say that because they are they are already completely degenerate, right? And any small perturbation can give rise to big effect, right? So therefore, it's not too trivial to understand the nature of the ground state that arises when t is large, but u is non-zero, small but non-zero, okay? Whether this kind of ground state structure will survive or not, okay? So that, that is the topic of uh, tomorrow's lecture. Yeah. Hmm? In the continuum limit? Yes. So in the continuum limit, there's no good basis. Theta and neither of them is a good basis. When I say good basis, I mean the basis in which the fluctuation is small. In the, in the large U limit, N was the good basis in that n doesn't fluctuate much. Theta fluctuate crazy, but n is classical. n doesn't change, fluctuate much, right? In the large t limit, theta is the good variable. n fluctuate a lot, but theta is almost classical. At the critical point, none of them is a good variable, OK? That's why it is very interesting, and, but it's harder to understand that ground state. Okay, yeah. 